Hello, Hope Cook here with Dermcast Live. Today I have Dr. Yasmin Kerkorian. Dr. Kerkorian is the Chief of Dermatology at Children's National Hospital in Washington, D.C. She's an expert in laser and surgical procedures and has a special interest in vascular and pigmented anomalies in infants. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming. I'm excited to learn more about vascular abnormalities in children and infants because I don't see a ton of infants. Yeah, no, it is definitely a challenge when you see a little newborn and they have a birthmark to kind of go through your mm -hmm. thought process and how to approach it. So thanks for inviting me. Yes, when I see a newborn on my schedule, my first thought is, ah, what do I do? <laughs> and my first thought is, yes, uh, I want to squish them. No, I get it. So yeah, a lot of um, parents get concerned about their beautiful baby skin, especially if they have like a birthmark or anything vascular. Mm -hmm. So what do you tell providers to notice or to, to be especially careful about when they're looking at a baby with a birthmark? Yeah, so it depends. I mean, there's many different kinds of birthmarks. They can be vascular, they can be pigmented or otherwise. And so the most common vascular birthmark, which we covered in the talk, are, um, is the infantile hemangioma. Um, and that is basically, we call it a hemangioma colloquially, a birthmark that is usually not present at birth either mm -hmm. at all or might be a flat spot. Um, a vasoconstricted spot, a bruise looking area. Parents mm -hmm. might think it was a scratch that occurred during the birth, but then in the first weeks of life, it rapidly sh mm -hmm. sort of shows itself um, as a red, usually a red bump or a blue bump that is growing. And mm -hmm. that proliferative period is what marks it as a distinct um, type of vascular birthmark and um, gives us the opportunity to think about, okay, do we need to treat them or not? Okay, so the parents take the baby home, baby looks perfect, maybe has like a slight little bruised look. Mm -hmm. And then at what point does this thing usually appear? Yeah, so the majority of growth in, occurs within the first three months, which means that even okay. in those first weeks of life, between that birth to the first week or two when they visit the pediatrician, there might be a change. So that's mm -hmm. why our primary care providers um, really play such a critical role in mm -hmm. getting these kids into us. Because if you're seeing a hemangioma in an area of concern, and in the um, lecture we talked about that there mm -hmm. is there are some guidelines published in pediatrics um, yeah. some clinical practice guidelines so if it's on for example the face or it's quite large on the body mm -hmm. then that's their opportunity to get them to us before it has grown a lot. Mm -hmm. How quickly do they need to get a baby in who has like you mentioned an eyelid or yeah. a cartilage? So the ideal circumstance would be before four weeks of age, okay. um, but that presumes that you have a referring provider. Uh -huh. So our job as pediatric dermatologists or other hemangioma specialists is to give you guys an avenue, those who need to right. refer a way to get them in. So at Children's National, we've developed a system to triage hemangiomas. We know through our call center and so on, we want to get any child under three months mm -hmm. in within a week. That's our practice. Oh, wow. Um, and even anywhere else, like, you know, I'm happy to have people email me if they have questions and other peds derms, but mm -hmm. you want to establish a relationship with someone, a dermatologist, a pediatric dermatologist, mm -hmm. or a hemangioma specialist, um, so that you can get the children in, or at least have advice on how to treat them um, as soon as possible, but certainly within the first three months. Mm -hmm. Which lesions possible. do you think would be okay to treat? Um, in our local practices with topical timolol or mm -hmm. something like that? I mean, I think um, in general, we want to um, give people, empower people to treat even with oral propranolol, mm -hmm. which is quite a safe medication, has good guidelines. Um, patient People who are taking care of uh, pediatric patients with hemangiomas because there really aren't enough mm -hmm. pediatric dermatologists for us to, um, expect, for, to expect us to treat all of them. So, um, First of all, I would say if you want to talk about timolol, you're really thinking about superficial hemangiomas, okay. those that are thin, that are red. If they're deep and nodular, it's highly unlikely to be effective. Right. Um, another caveat would be if they're ulcerated, you just want to be a little thoughtful about, okay, if I'm applying timolol to this, is there going to be systemic uh, yeah. absorption? And are, could there potentially be consequences of that to the baby? And if you, you said, I think, if it's ulcerated, you really need oral propranolol. Usually, so okay. there there could be um, people have different opinions on that. So if it's a shallow ulcer that can be treated with wound care mm -hmm. alone, you may not need propranolol. Um, but definitely, if the ulceration seems like it's going to be large, we usually are doing some degree of propranolol because you want to heal it as soon as possible in conjunction with wound mm -hmm. care. Um, that can get into the weeds because sometimes if you dose the propranolol at a very high dose, you might mm -hmm. actually 
provoke the ulcer to worsen. So, okay. but generally speaking, if you're worried that an ulcer is going to happen, and when you look at the skin, if you see in a very young baby gray or crusting or a scab, mm -hmm. um, you at least are thinking to yourself, do I need systemic therapy and how am I going to initiate that? Mm -hmm. And it would be better to ask, right, than just, yeah. you know, play the safe side and give to Malal and then... I think so. Like, I, I think it's wonderful when we all collaborate. So I have no problem. I really enjoy working closely with our pediatricians and primary care providers. And I love when they email me and they're like, should I refer this kid to you? And I'm like, no, it's fine. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> or yes, please do. We'll get them in tomorrow. So it's a question of having a network where you have that ability. Um, and as we get more and more comfortable, I think we, um, you know, may hand that initiation off more to people in the community just because, again, there's so mm -hmm. many babies with mangiomas and only so many pediatric dermatologists. Right. Yeah. Will you say more about breast hemangiomas? Yeah, so I had highlighted that in those clinical practice guidelines that breast hemangiomas, in particular large ones that involve the entire breast, need to be considered for treatment. And that is because there have been papers that have shown that if we don't treat the hemangioma, especially in a female child, that the breast tissue may not develop at mm -hmm. puberty. So you'll have unilateral hypoplasia of the breast. So in that circumstance, not a small like focal one, a little dot mm -hmm. on the breast, but rather a large one involving the entire breast, mm -hmm. I would recommend considering treating with oral um, propranolol because you may, um, by preventing the proliferation of the hemangioma, you may preserve the breast tissue. Mm -hmm. um, it definitely requires more research for us to follow these children that have been treated into mm -hmm. puberty and see, well, you know, maybe the hemangioma alone's existence Mm -hmm. cause the breast tissue to be hypoplastic. But I think it makes sense from my perspective to treat them before they distort that breast tissue and change it into fiber fatty tissue. Right, yeah, that does make sense. So what about um, cartilage? You mentioned a little bit about ear cartilage. Yeah, and I didn't get to touch on nose cartilage, but nose is almost more important. Um, so any cartilaginous structure, the nose or the ear, <clears throat> excuse me, is at high risk for getting damaged with mm -hmm. an infantile hemangioma. So the nasal tip is actually a really good example. Mm -hmm. You can get this bulbous deformity, a Cyrano de Bergerac deformity, where you get kind of like um, the cartilage damage and a, a kind of a round shaped nose, mm -hmm. very challenging to fix with plastic surgery. Yeah. So we any nasal hemangioma really at least should be considered for treatment, okay. whether it's on the ala, the tip, the bridge of the nose, um, because there is really very little fatty tissue here, so you mm -hmm. have very room, small room to have error. On the ear, um, it sort of depends. If it's a small one on the lobule, maybe not, but if you're going to have any cartilaginous mm -hmm. damage or ulceration, it's worth a consideration for treatment. Yeah. And how soon should you start seeing results if you do start a baby on propranolol? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. It depends. So if they're very young, mm -hmm. you almost within 24 hours. And actually, wow. in the initial paper in the New England Journal um, by the group that discovered this, the utility of propranolol, they showed this, that within 24 hours there was a lightning. And in fact, you'll see that. So wow. in our really little babies that have high-risk hemangiomas mm -hmm. that we in admit, which is really rare, it's uncommon to admit a patient in my practice. But if they're under five weeks adjusted age and they have comorbidity, we do occasionally still admit some children mm -hmm. and we'll start the drug and within 24 hours parents will say it's lighter so yeah. you do see that um, if it's an older child or it's a deeper hemangioma it may be more subtle but the effect mm -hmm. is quite quick like between the first visits let's say you do your first visit in a two month old and you see them back four weeks later mm -hmm you'll see eff efficacy. In fact, if you saw nothing, I would question whether it was in fact an infantile hemangioma. Okay, and then if you- Or your dose, yeah, sorry. Sorry, no, if you are seeing results, how long would you typically leave a baby on that? Yeah, so um, it, the literature suggests that if you stop the drug before nine months, you're more likely to see rebound growth oh, okay. so that um, you may have had benefit and then it will start to grow again. Mm -hmm. And you may be able to recapture efficacy, that's fine. In other words, you restart the drug and they'll get better again. Mm -hmm. But because of that, um, I tend to keep the children on until at least nine months. If they've had a superb response, I might try to early taper, mm -hmm. but otherwise usually till a year and then taper it and see if they uh, are able to come off it successfully. If they come, if as I'm tapering it, I see growth, then we just restart the mm -hmm. medication and we keep trying to taper. Um, most cases, it's a year. There are certain exceptions, for example, parotid hemangiomas mm -hmm. or um, deep hemangiomas of the nasal tip that just seem to require mm -hmm. longer term treatment. And are parents usually open to oral propranolol or do you get pushback? I actually feel that parents are generally open to it. Um, I think it varies a little bit regionally and I also mm -hmm. think it varies on how you 
like everything in medicine, how we present mm -hmm. it to the family. So if we highlight the side effects as our leading right. this part of our discussion, you know, that's probably not going to be helpful. If we highlight the fact that this is a drug that has been used for a very long time in cardiology, mm -hmm. that has a good safety record, that um, has been used in clinical trials in children for hemangiomas and mm -hmm. our own practice in thousands and thousands of children, um, I think we can reassure parents. On the other hand, it, like all discussions, it is a risk-benefit analysis. Mm -hmm. So a parent might say, you know, I'm just not interested and that's fine. Um, if it's not functionally impairing, then you have that discussion. If it's purely going to be, or I shouldn't say purely, but if your main concern is disfigurement, that's a serious concern. Mm -hmm. um, if it's functionally impairing, then you're going to, you usually don't have pushback because they can understand right. they're not going to be able to eat or see. But if it's mid-cheek, for example, I still think parents understand the mm -hmm. impact of disfigurement. So we don't want to also falsely reassure people oh, it'll go away, it's fine. Mm -hmm. So you want both sides. Well, this is what may happen. They may have a small but observable fiber fatty residue that you might need plastic surgery for. If we treat them, that might not be the case. And then the parent might say, you know what, for me, it's not worth the medication. Mm -hmm. I'm just gonna go and see what happens. And others will say, that's not, that risk of disfigurement is not acceptable to me, I want the medication. Mm -hmm. um, so for the gray area, that's how I pose the discussion. For the ones mm -hmm. that absolutely require treatment, I'm just very direct and then mm -hmm. you know, we go from there. Yeah, I bet your job is very rewarding when you do get to see the yeah. the drastic changes after treating some of these. Yeah, that's what I love about infantile hemangioma is that you see this absolute like immediate payoff or rapid payoff and real change for those children. And it's a really interesting dynamic birthmark. It's interesting to see something that's rapidly changing in, the, in both in growth and um, involution. So I, I find that to be exciting and I just love babies. Anyone who's ever worked <laughs> oh. with me knows that I love little babies. I just feel so excited and happy to see them. And so I think that that's another rewarding part. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have any final tips for providers who are seeing babies for these infantile hemangiomas? Well, I would say uh, just to not to steer us in a completely different direction, but not everything that's a vascular birthmark is a hemangioma. Mm -hmm. In fact, by far the majority are, 99 plus percent. However, we have rarer vascular tumors, some of which we covered in the lecture. And so if something does not make sense, mm -hmm. if it's not fitting that protocol, for example, you know, they come into your office and the parents are absolutely insistent, no, this was a bump at birth. And uh -huh, then yeah. my method in that scenario is to ask them to show me a newborn picture uh -huh. um, and see if I can look at it. But if it's a vascular tumor at birth, a growth at birth, you know it's not an infantile hemangioma. And then it becomes a process of, you know, maybe you're getting an ultrasound, mm -hmm. maybe you're referring. So just keep in mind, if something is not fitting your expectation um, of what an infantile hemangioma should do, that there are many hundreds of other vascular um, anomalies and malformations, and those require totally different workup and treatment, medical, sclerotherapy, mm -hmm. surgical, what have you, multidisciplinary. And so we don't want to miss those zebras mm -hmm. um, within our practice. And if we're not sure, then that's when we can reach out to these vascular anomalies, centers of excellence mm -hmm. for some help. That is a great tip. And yeah. this has been very informational. Thank you for sharing with us Thanks today. Thanks so much for having me, yeah. Hope Cook, coming to you live from Austin, Texas.